clock on the computer is showing 12, so I think it's 12 central time. So I think I'd, I'll go ahead and start. Um, is that okay, Chantal? I remember smallpox vaccines too. In fact, the first time I fainted when I got a shot, it was a smallpox vaccine. Okay, well, what I'd like to do is uh, tell you about a little project that I did several months ago and thought I would just share it with you. Um, it's, it's a little strange, but, uh, but I enjoyed it and I thought that some of you might enjoy it too. First thing I have to do is get out of the way of my arrows. Okay. Okay, as you all know, uh, mutation is a change in a DNA sequence. And mutations are important because the differences that, uh, that distinguish one organism from another are mostly arrived at by mutations, the origin of most differences in DNA sequences. DNA sequences have the information that make us all who or at least what we are. Mutations occur mostly randomly. Uh, they can occur during DNA replication itself, just by a replication error, or sometimes by chemical modification or by radiation. Most mutations are single nucleotide replacements. That is, one base in the DNA is, is uh, replaced by another base. And if a mutation occurs in a protein coding gene, then it can ch change the protein by changing the encoded amino acid. And then if that occurs in a gamete producing cell, then it may be inherited. If it's just produced somewhere else in your body, then it won't be inherited, but you might suffer from it. So a lot of genes are protein coding genes and they determine the amino acid sequence of proteins. Amino acids are the, are the um, structural unit of proteins and a protein is just a long string of amino acids that are sort of all folded up. Um, one of the examples we're gonna be looking at this morning is um, beta globin. And beta globin is one of the two molecules in the oxygen transport protein hemoglobin. And the reference coding sequence for beta globin is showing here. Um, and then below is the translation. And you'll notice that the, the DNA sequence is a lot longer than the protein sequence because there are about three bases for every amino acid. So what sometimes happens when you get a change in a base, like here's a, a three base codon, um, you have three bases per amino acid and those are called codons. And if one of these changes to a different codon, then a different amino acid may be produced. For example, uh, one, ex one example that I think uh, Stephen actually mentioned last time is the mutation that occurs in sickle cell disease you get an A in the DNA codon changing to a T um, in the codon of the, of the sickle cell gene. And this changes the amino acid from glutamate, which is the E, to valine, which is the V. So that is a typical amino acid substitution that you sometimes see. And sometimes these substitutions are consequential. It may affect how, uh, how the protein functions um, reduces the function of, of the sickle cell gene, although it does also make it um, make individuals who carry it resistant to malaria. Another kind of mutation is what you see in the next line. So you change the GAG to a TAG, 
And in this case, there is no amino acid substitution. What you get instead is what's called a stop codon, a stop signal, so that when the protein is translated on the ribosomes, the ribosome sees that signal and says, OK, I'm done. Uh, and those are nearly always very destructive of the protein, unless they occur very late along the sequence. And then finally, you have an odd little mutation, which you see in this fourth line here, where you have GAG changing to GAA. And in this case, although the codon has changed, the amino acid does not change. And this is what we call a silent mutation. So you have had a mutation, but it has no effect on changing the amino acid sequence in the protein. So they're called silent because they don't change the amino acid. Now, the reason that some amino acid, that some uh, mutations are silent is because of the structure of the genetic code. So in the universal genetic code, there's 20 amino acids, which you see in these little little blue three three letter signals, alanine, threonine, proline, serine. Um, and each of those is encoded by a three base codon. But what you find is that these codons come in blocks. So there are 64 codons and only 20 amino acids. So on average, there's three amino acids per codon. Um, in real life, it's more like some, sometimes there's four and sometimes there's two. So this, these four blocks here have four amino acids, or four codons per amino acid. These little half blocks here have two codons per amino acid. And then there are a few codons which are stop codons. There are only three of these in the universal code. So if you change this third base in the codon, you may not change the amino acid. And especially if you change it for the same kind of base. And notice that these, these two half blocks always occupy either the upper or the lower part of the coding block. So these two both end in purines, adenine or guanine. These two both end in these two both end in pyrimidines, uh, which are uracil or cytosine. Uracil because this is the RNA version of the code. So sometimes you have two, sometimes you have four, sometimes you have three, sometimes you have one, sometimes you have six. But on average, there are about three codons for amino acids. And this, this repetitiveness in the code is because is why you can get a silent mutation. So if you change this base to this base, it won't change the amino acid. And that works because of the way that proteins are translated. Proteins are translated using another kind of RNA called transfer RNA. And transfer RNA carries an amino acid and matches it up with the messenger RNA codon on the ribosome. And so the, the structure of the code is actually enforced by the transfer RNAs. That's, that's where the code actually exists, is in what transfer RNAs match up with what messenger RNA codon. So some of these transfer RNAs can match to more than one codon. And this partial mismatch is called wobble. So if you've got two or sometimes three similar codons, the same tRNA can add the same amino acid uh, to, to both opposite both codons. So that's why some mutations are silent. This is just a, a quick summary of some of the wobble rules. And you'll notice that uh, in the anti-codon of the transfer RNA, the anti-codon is uh, a three-base sequence on the transfer RNA that matches with a three-base sequence on the messenger RNA. And the third base of the messenger RNA codon, or the first base of the transfer RNA, anti-codon, 
is the wobble position. So that base in the anticodon position can be one of uh, lots of different modified bases. Transfer RNA has a lot of funny bases, which is not true of, uh, of most other RNAs. The transfer RNA is kind of weird in that respect. Um, and why that is, is a totally different story, so I won't go into that. This next slide is just a picture of some of those funny bases. A lot of them are just methylated versions of the regular base. So this is methyl adenine, this is methyl guanine, this is methyl inosine, this is inosine unmethylated. You can see that inosine is a purine. It looks a little bit like adenine uh, and a little bit like guanine. But, uh, but this is just some of the funny bases that you find in transfer RNA. OK, so how did I get interested in these silent mutations? Uh, last semester, when I was teaching my non-major genetics course, I asked a student a question. And if you look at the same protein coding gene in two different species, which is going to be more different, the coding sequence of the DNA or the amino acid sequence of the protein? So in the genetic code, you have three bases per amino acid. So if you have a coding sequence of 300 bases, that would give you a protein of 100 amino acids. So generally, if you make one base change, you might get one amino acid change. And since the amino, since the proteins are only a third along, as long as the coding sequence of the DNA, then there you would expect to find actually more change on a percentage basis in the amino acid than you find in the DNA. So if you had 30 bases, 30 changes in a DNA, then that would give you 10%. If you change 30 amino acids, then that would give you 30%. So that's what I wanted them to think about, was that difference in structure and the difference in number and how that's reflected in the percentage of difference in DNA and in the But since there's more than one codon per amino acid, And since you have either, usually either four or two codons for amino acid, you have an average number of three codons for amino acid. So changes in the third base of the codon don't usually change the amino acid. So only two thirds of the time are you going to get a mutation that will change the amino acid. So if we have 30 mutations in a 300 base coding sequence, you still have 10% of the DNA. But now only 20 of those changes will change the amino acid. So the protein still changes as a percentage by, by more than the DNA. But generally, it's one amino acid change per DNA change. So that's a testable hypothesis because we have, uh, for many species and for many proteins, we have the coding sequences of their DNA, and we have the amino acid sequences of their proteins. Um, and as you know, or as you may know, I love to snoop in the databases. And this is a question that can be answered by snooping in the databases. Excuse me, I've got a big dog in my lap right now. Okay. Good dog. And so I thought, well, I'll just check and see if that is the situation. That if you get 30 base changes, you'll only have 20 amino acid changes. So this is, this is what I learned by looking at the databases. And it turned out to be interesting. OK, so mutations are different in different species because one species separate, once, once the, the lineage in which two species uh, are found have separated, then they can accumulate different mutations just at random. So if these mutations occur more or less randomly, then the longer any two species have been separated, the more mutations will occur between them. 
And because of that, we can use the number of differences in DNA or in protein sequences to look at the, the relative uh, relationships between organisms. So this is the basis of molecular phylogeny. So on the next slide, there's a sample phylogeny based on the beta globins of 12 species, humans, dogs, horses, cows, camels, llamas, whales, dolphins, seals, rhinos, and gibbets. And here is that phylogeny. And in this, the two species that are most closely related will be on a single fork, like this one here, where you have humans and gibbons. This is Hylobates lar, which is a gibbon. And uh, humans and gibbons only differ by two amino acids in their beta globins. Um, interestingly, camels, Bactrian camels, and llamas also agree, differ by only two amino acids. So this, this length here, here to here represents two amino acid changes. So if you look at uh, this difference between rhino and horse up here, you can see it's about six times as long as the one between humans and gibbons. And so there are about 12 amino acid differences between humans and horses. And then the most distantly related pair is hippos and cows, which is here. All right, so these are, but these, these are all due to mutations that produced in the amino acid chain. So how do you find the differences that don't produce in the amino acid chain? How do you find the silent mutation? So I'm just gonna tell you the story of three proteins, beta globin, amylogenin, and rhodopsin and how those compare in two uh, rather divergent mammalian species, Canis lupus familiaris, or dogs, and humans. But we'll be looking at these three proteins and their DNAs and in these two different species, humans and dogs. So this is the beta globin sequence, the protein sequence for beta globin in humans. And down below that, we have an alignment between the human and the dog beta globins. And the middle line in this alignment tells you how many of these amino acids are not changed. So if it's the same as the top and the bottom line, then they're not changed. But if you've got a gap in that middle line, or if you have some other symbol in that middle line, then that represents a change that has occurred. And the first four of those are marked with these little arrows here. I didn't go through and mark them all, but the first four. So if you go through this, these two proteins, you can see that there are 15 differences between the human and the dog. And they're in different parts of the sequence. So what does the DNA look like? This is the beta globin coding sequence, the part of the part of the DNA sequence that is translated on the ribosome. No, split, split. Not talking to you, talking to the dogs. Okay, so this is the beta globin coding sequence in humans and in dogs. And you can see there are a number of differences here. And there are 53 differences. 15 of those are reflected by amino acid changes. So if only a third of the mutations are silent, then there should just be a lot fewer silent mutations. There should only be about eight silent mutations here. And there are a lot more because 38 of these differences are not reflected in the amino acid chain. They're exactly the same, even though the DNAs are different. So this is amylogenin. Uh, this, is, this is the uh, protein that puts the enamel on your teeth. 
And if you compare the human and the dog proteins, there are 17 differences. Now, in this case, one of these differences is in a gap. That gap is right here, where there's a skip over an amino acid. So a whole codon is missing in the human sequence that is present in the dog sequence. So only 16 of these differences are actually in, in the amino acid sequence. So I'm just going to ignore the gaps. So we've got 17 differences in the amino acid sequence. And here's the amylogen encoding sequence. And it's somewhat similar to what we saw in beta globulin. There are 39 differences, but three of those are in the gap, so we're only going to count 36 of them. And there are only 20, or I'm sorry, there are only 16 differences in the amino acid, and the other 20 are silent. There's too many silent mutations. Let's look at one more protein. And this is rhodopsin. This is the light sensing protein that you use for your night vision. It's in your retina. Uh, and it's a bigger protein, it's 300 and something. Uh, amino acids long. And again, there are 16 amino acid changes in the sequence. Uh, however, there are a total of 26 differences, but 10 of those are in this big gap that's right here. So there's a big chunk that's missing from the human protein that's present in the dog protein. So if you're looking only at the, the coding sequences that are found in both species, there are 16 amino acid differences. And in this case, uh, since it's a bigger protein, it's a bigger coding sequence, and it, that actually takes two pages, and I'll show you the second page in a minute. But overall, there are 30 amino acids, or, or 30 um, bases in the gap, and 76 in the coding sequence. So only 16 of those produce an amino acid change, and the other 60 codon differences are silent. So there are more than there ought to be. Oh, this is just the rest of the rhodopsin sequence. Come on up. Yes. Okay, so this is the rest of the rhodopsin sequence, and you can see that there are a lot of, a lot of gaps in here. Okay, so I'm just going to look at a translation of a part of the rhodopsin sequence. So this is one, two, three, four, five lines of code. They're divided into the individual codons. And each of the, um, each of the codon differences is in bold type. And each difference that gives rise to a different amino acid uh, the, the different amino acid in the dog is shown below. So we've got uh, isoleucine in humans, we've got valine in dogs, we've got valine in humans up here, and methionine in dogs. So these red ones are the ones that are different. So in these five lines of sequence, there are 25 mutated codons, or 25 mutations. Um, and Five of these result in substitutions, and the other 20 are silent. So, why is this? Well, wait, let's back up. Let's just look at a summary of uh, those differences to begin with. So, here you've got the three proteins. These are um, the number of amino acids in the protein. So, rhodopsin is about twice the size of the other two. Um, and these are the coding sequence differences, and these are the amino acid differences. And in each case, there's, there's many more silent mutations than there are um, non-silent mutations. But those are all relatively small proteins. So I also looked at one larger protein. This is the cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator sequence which is a, a chloride transporter in, cell, in the cell membrane. And it has almost 1,500 amino acids. 
there are 468 coding sequence differences and 147 differences in the proteins. The protein. So that is roughly between uh, what we see in amylogenin and what we see in beta. And again, there's just way more sonnet mutations than there are non-sonnet mutations. So why are there so many sonnet mutations? Why do the sonnet mutations prevail? And there are three possible reasons that we can look at. Wait until that comes into focus for me, at least. Hoping that it will also be in focus for you. Come on, focus. Focus, focus, focus. Here it goes. Okay, can you all see it? All right, so, so three possibilities are that silent mutations may be more common because of the chemistry of mutation. That is, maybe you're just more likely to get a silent mutation than you are to get non silent mutation. And the code also produces a certain number of silent mutations. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that if you get side-by-side -side mutations in the same codon, it's only going to be expressed once. So not all mutations that are unexpressed are really silent mutations. Because if you have two mutations in the same codon, you are going to have a different amino acid. And then finally, Silent mutations may be more common because there's very strong natural selection in favor of not messing with the protein. So in most cases, if you do change the amino acid, or if the mutation does change the amino acid, uh, the individual that's carrying that mutation just dies. It's not compatible with survival. So these silent mutations are the surviving mutations, and the other non-silent mutations that we don't see in these proteins are the ones that kill you. Okay, so we're just going to take a quick look at those three possibilities. Uh, and the first has to do with the structure of the code in the chemistry of mutation. So when you get a base change, during uh, either either due to uh, chemical interference or radiation or uh, just an accident of, uh, of replication, you're more likely to get a transition, that is a purine for a purine or a pyrimidine for a pyrimidine, than you are to get what's called a transversion, in which a purine changes for a pyrimidine. Uh, and if you look at the structure of the code, you see that anytime you've got just two codons for a, a given amino acid, it's either two pyrimidines or it's two purines. And so if you change that, you're likely, you're more likely to change it to another purine or to another pyrimidine than you are to change the different kind of uh, base, which may be, which is more likely to give you a mutation. So, so that's one thing. Um, also, of course, transitions in the third position are very likely always to be silent because of the structure of the code. So let's look at the transitions and the transversions in that rhodopsin sequence that we looked at a while ago. These are the five mutational changes that you see in the sequence. Uh, again, the mutated codons are in boldface type, and the transversions are marked with TB over the codon. Everything that's not marked TB is a transition. So of the 25 mutations, only six are transversion. But, and you would expect that maybe they would all be expressed by an amino acid change, but only one of those is associated with an amino acid change, this one here at the end. 
and the other four differences in the sequence are all due to base one transitions. So it's these base one transitions that have actually caused more mutations than the six transversions. So it's not just due, at least in this particular uh, passage of DNA, it's not just due to the chemistry. All right, so the second thing we could look at is um, how often do you get two mutations side by side? So if you're only going to get one change, if you get any change, in the codon. Uh, and in the proteins that we looked at, um, the beta globin sequence has the most clustering. So we're going to look at how that clustering contributes to amino acid changes in the protein. So this is the whole coding sequence from beta globin. Um, and the codons that have um, more than one base difference in them have been underlined. So these, these are the clustered codons. For example, there's three. There's three changes in this one here. There's two in this one here. There's only one in this one here. So this is not underlined. OK, so everything is not underlined. This has a single base change. And the others have either two or three. So of those 53 nucleotide substitutions, only 42 codons are actually changed. And all of the eight codons that have more than one change, you get an amino acid change. So of the 15 amino acid changes, uh, eight of them are due to multiple changes in the sequence. So they all they will all change. But all and all of the multi-change codons will change the amino acid. But of the 34 nucleotide changes that you see, the single nucleotide changes that you see in these codons, 80% of them are still silent. So it's not just due to clustering. So even the single changes predominantly are silent mutations. So our third possibility, uh, oh, sorry. Um, all right, so if you're assuming random mutation, then about a third of the mutations should be silenced, and mostly those that change only the third nucleotide of the codon. In the beta globin gene, there are 10 first position mutations, eight second position mutations, and 34 third position mutations. So there are three times as many mutations in that third position than there are in the other two, because changing the other two will change the amino acid. So silent mutations seem to be very strongly selected. So most changes, what that means is that most changes that do change the amino acid are going to kill you. So Darwin wins again. Now, we've only looked at four proteins in two species, humans and dogs. Humans and dogs are in two different branches of uh, the, the mammalian phylogenetic tree. Humans are in the Uarcontoglyris, and dogs are in the Laurasiosteria which are two of the three major branches of the mammals. So here's the UR contoglyris up here, and that includes the primates, which is everything in red, uh, and rodents and rabbits. So humans and mice are basically in the UR, the UR contoglyris, and here's the human sequence up here. Uh, and then dog is down here in the Laurasia theory. So the UR contoglyris and the Laurasia theory diverged from each other about 90 million years ago. So they've been separate for a long, long time, a lot of time to accumulate mutations. And yet we only see uh, a number of silent mutations plus just a few amino acid changes. 
So that's just a reflection of the tolerance of proteins for amino acid changes in their sequence. Some proteins are more tolerant of change than others. For example, the histones are very intolerant of change. The histones in all species are very similar. So if you change one of those, you're going to break the protein. But amylogenin and rhodopsin and beta globin are relatively tolerant of some change. Uh, oh, I actually see a question. Uh, is there any way to determine if a silent mutation in a third spot later switches to a mutation in which one or two of them change? I think the way to track that would be to look at uh, species that are more closely related and in which, uh, which most of the mutations are silent and then uh, look at more distantly related species to see if a um, the second change in that same codon has produced a change uh, in another species. So you could track it down. You could track it down. So, so there could be a mutation that is silent in one species but not silent in another species in the same codon. Is that, was that the question? So you could start with a silent mutation um, and then get a non-silent one. But two-thirds of the time, you're going to get a non-silent one. And most of the time, that's going to kill you. So about 10%, and I'm actually surprised it's as high as that. So about 10% of the mutations that change the amino acid sequence are survivable, and the others are not. Okay, so um, I could stop here and take questions, or I could go on to this last question, which is, are silent mutations really totally silent? That is, does the fact that you don't change the amino acid mean that you don't change the protein at all? It wouldn't seem to be changeable, because if you haven't changed the amino acid, why would it change the protein? But there are some, there are some uh, effects that silent mutations can have on the protein. Uh, and this again has to do with the transfer RNAs. So the transfer RNAs have to match, uh, they're very fussy molecules, they have to match two uh, different binding sites. They have to recognize the tRNA binding sites on the translating ribosome and they also have to recognize the binding sites on the enzyme that puts the amino acid on the tRNA. Uh, these are the amino acyl tRNA synthetases. And so you've got to, to slot that transfer RNA into both places. So the structure of that tRNA can be quite fussy. And if you look at the codons that are used in different species. And this is, this is the, these are the codons that you actually find in the human genome. So for example, if you look at all of uh, these alanine codons, nearly half of them are GCC. And the other three codons are only used about half as often as GCC is used. So this is, this is favored. Um, in these valine codons, uh, GUG is the favorite codon. And in this leucine codon, um, and this, there are six leucine codons, these two up here and these four down here. 40% um, of those codons, even though there's six of them, are CUG. Uh, and in this one over here, you have uh, the glutamine, two glutamine codons. And 73% of those are, three quarters of those, are the CAG codon. Um, in other cases, you may get about equal numbers. For example, these, these two, asparagine or these two glycine codons um, are somewhat different, but they're, but they're more similar than, uh, than some of these others. So in some cases, uh, there are favored codons. 
So what if you switch out a favored codon for a non-favored codon? Well, why is this a favored codon? Because that's the one that the DNA likes. So if you switch to a less favored codon, then maybe the codon anti-codon interaction is going to slow down a little bit. The protein won't get made as quickly, um, or it might uh, the protein folding that accompanies translation may be slowed down a little. So you may not alter the protein itself, but you may alter the quantity of the protein that gets made if you have silent mutations. So it's possible that silent mutations do have some effect on the phenotype. Oh, does that extend to plants? Oh, that's a very good question, Phil. You know, you could actually do that experiment. You could look at, uh, at different proteins in plants and see, see if it goes for plants too. Because those proteins still have to function even though they're in plants. I, I would guess that it does go for plants, but but it's an excellent question, um, and I'm going to show you the uh, the links to. Um, oh, sorry, let me do that. I'm going to show you the links to the software that will let you compare those. So this is OMIM. OMIM is Online Mendelian Genetics in Man. And yes, it is Man. Sorry, uh, but. Um, this is all of the DNA sequences and the protein sequences for human genes. So humans are, are all in OMIM. Um, this was where I found the codon usage, and then this is what you want to use to do the comparisons. Uh, the BLAST software is free. You can download it or you can use it online. Um, it's at N if you just type in NCBI BLAST, it'll take you right to it. You can, you can actually Google it. Um, yeah, I suspect that there is codon preference for plants. I suspect that there is. Anyway, so if you wanted to try out some of these, uh, you are certainly welcome to do it because it's all free. It's all taxpayer supported. Um, and uh, so there it is. Okay, you have a question about reclassifying a coding sequence to become a non-coding sequence. Um, if, oh, oh, I, I think the question you're asking, Syzygy, may be, would, would a difference in RNA preference make a, a coding sequence in one species be a non-coding sequence in another species? Is that the question you're asking, Syzygy? Oh, okay, say it again. What do you mean when you say reclassifying a coding sequence to become a non-coding sequence? Yeah, quite a lot of the DNA in uh, in most mammalian genomes uh, is not protein coding. Only about 25% of the DNA sequences are, are protein coding genes. And in those sequences, most of those are, most of that sequence is introns, especially in the big genes, which is, which is not part of the coding sequence. It's non-coding. DNA, which is spliced out of the messenger RNA, which is then translated into the protein. A coding, a coding sequence is a sequence that encodes a protein. So if you've got a chunk of DNA that doesn't encode a protein, then it's non-coding DNA. Now, there's, there's some question about what you should call regulatory RNAs, because they don't, they don't encode proteins but they're also functional. They're also functional in the genome. They do things. They're regulatory molecules. So those are functional molecules that are not proteins. Uh, 
Uh, not unless you, oh yes, you could change it if you get a mutation in a transfer RNA. If you get a mutation in a transfer RNA, then it will either put in a different amino acid or in, it might put in no amino acid, it might put in a stop codon. Um, so, and, and you do get transfer RNA mutations. Now, you have a lot of copies of your RNA genes. There's a bunch of different transfer RNAs, and you have multiple copies of all of them. Uh, so if you lost one, it might not be too serious, but uh, if you lost an important one and you changed it into something else, it could, it could screw up uh, the translation. But it would only be in that one cell. Unless, of course, it's in a gamete-producing cell, which would be in you and all your children. Uh, no, they don't recognize mutations at all. The only thing they the only thing that they recognize is mismatches between the two sides of the DNA. So the DNA polymerase, for example, will will you know go along and plug in the bases, and if it makes a mistake, it can back up and fix it. Which is why RNA viruses are, are more mutable than DNA viruses, because the RNA polymerases don't have that um, correcting function. So they, they, don't, uh, they don't say, oh, that's a mutation. They just know that it does match, it matches the other strand. As long as it matches the other strand, they're okay. <laughs> it might make an annoying be beeping sound, I don't know. Well, if there are if there are no other questions for now, I actually have a few more slides that I, I didn't include in the regular talk, and it has to do with uh, exons and introns. I mentioned to you that the coding sequence includes only the exons, so only this red underlined part here gets into the messenger RNA and gets translated into the protein. Um, Yes, double-stranded double stranded DNAs um, are more resistant, and probably RNAs are more resistant to mutation. Okay, so yes, the answer to that is being, du being double-stranded is probably the reason why DNA replaced RNA as the genomic material um, billions of years ago. Did that answer your question, Suzuki? Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, the the uh, RNAs are um, catalytic. That is, they, they can catalyze some chemical reaction. And so they serve some of the functions of proteins and some of the informational functions of, uh, of nation. And that, has, that was taken over. Those two functions were both taken over by other molecules and got out of RNA world we do catal catalysis with most catalysis. There are still some catalytic arms. We do most catalysis proteins and we do most genomes with uh, with DNA. There are some uh, as you know there are some viral genomes but uh, but most genomes are DNA. Yes the the changes that uh, that that do change the function of a protein in a way that is advantageous are the same kind of mutations. For example, and uh, actually rhodopsin is kind of an interesting one to look at in that case because uh, different animals are sensitive to uh, their, their 
especially their cone opsins, say the, the red, green, and blue opsins, are very sensitive to different wavelengths of light. And if you change those so that they're different, they're sensitive to a different wavelength, then that would give you the ability to see stuff that you couldn't see before, like you get ultraviolet vision, which a lot of insects have. That's how they find their identify their flowers by the ultraviolet patterns on the, on the flowers. And some uh, some rodents, I think, can see ultraviolet. Um, and that's because, uh, well, the, the function, one of the functions of being able to do that is that when they when they track around, they sort of pee on their feet and leave pissy footprints as they run around. Um, and then their family can keep up with them because they see those footprints because uh, they're urine fluorescent. And the mice can see that. You can't see it. Uh, but the mice can see it. So, yes, you can acquire new functions. And if, in fact, uh, the red, uh, the red cone opsin in humans is a duplication of the green cone opsin, which has then changed its its sensitivity, it's changed its spectral sensitivity, so that it can see red light. And yes, you could change it to seeing UV. In fact, a lot of people have uh, extra two or three extra green genes, and it'd be really interesting if some of those green genes became ultraviolet sensing genes, certainly possible. So they could see infrared or they might be able to see ultraviolet. No kidding. That's interesting. Cataract surgery, so replacing the lens gives you more more UV sensitivity. Huh. Well, I've had cataract surgery. I'll have to uh, <laughs> go look at some UV sometime. I'll have to go out and look at the flowers in the dark and see if I can see any. No, that's true. You shouldn't look at it without without your glasses on. If I have my glasses on, then I can't see it. Thanks for that reminder, CCG. Well, it's an interesting question. And and I think the the ultimate fate of those extra green genes is uh, an interesting question. If we if we if we survive as a species for another million years, we might indeed develop new powers. We don't use blue sensitive photosensors for vision? Or we don't use them just for vision? Or is that different blue sensitive photoreceptors? Uh, with color blindness, most color blindness is due either to a change in uh, one of the color receptors, either the red, green, or the blue. Um, and the red and the green are both side by side on the X chromosome. Um, they may may simply change, uh, just get a, a, a mutation that alters it so that it's non-functional. But mostly, uh, the gene is deleted. Mostly, if you're red insensitive, then all or part 
of the red gene or all or part of the green gene has been diluted. Oh, what island is that, Shiloh? Thank you. The island of the color. Stephen, what is that reference? Well, sometimes islands are colonized by very small groups of people, and so they get very inbred. Cryptochrome blue light photoreceptor. Oh, okay. So it's a different kind of blue photoreceptor. Cool. Do you know where, you know which chromosome it's on? The regular blue gene is on is on chromosome three. Single lap single lap Very interesting. What kind? Is it red or green? Uh, I don't know what kind of color blindness he has. It's probably red, green, blue is um, occurs, but it's it's very rare. Red, red, green color blindness is so common because it's X linked, and so a lot of males have it. I actually have a colleague who is completely, totally color blind. He does not see colors at all, and I don't know what his, I don't know why that is. Color blindness is inherited, yes. Yeah, what, about one out of 12 males is colorblind. Achromatopsia. Colors at all. Boy, that would be sad. It would be sad not to see colors at all, I think. I don't know. Maybe if you've never seen colors, you don't notice. Uh, my pleasure. I just enjoyed the little project, and I thought, oh, the next time Chantal asks for a presentation, I'll that one. It's kind of nerdy. <laughs> yeah, I try to be careful when I'm making slides for students not to use red or to use a red that's that's visible, like that dark red that's up there. Um, thank you, thank you. Oh, yes, Chantel, I so appreciate everything you do to put these on, because I know it must take a lot of work. Oh, what's what's the fourth uh, color, Stephen? Is, are they ultraviolet or? Yeah, we don't necessarily have the best color vision in the world. Or the best anything, as far as that goes. Look at that. Ah, that's ultraviolet. Okay. 
Very interesting. It would be. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if, if some uh, nocturnal predators didn't have the lurid uh, infrared vision. No, your night vision is deuterodopsin. That's a different protein. Ah, oh, so some of those some of those green genes are turning into something else. Cool. Oh yeah, like the raptors have terrific uh, resolution in their vision, way better than ours. And sharks have, um, and a lot of other fish have um, magnetic receptors, elect electro electrochemical. So, Sherry, do you know what the fourth color is in uh, human females that have tetrachrome vision? I'm going to Google that. Oh, they can, yes. They, uh, snakes can, can follow heat, heat signals. I, I just saw, I just saw a couple, but probably missed most of them. Great questions. Y'all ask really good questions. Oh, thank you, Phil, for that article. Thank you all for coming. Got that bookmarked. Well, I do love to snoop in the databases. I, I always think of snooping in the databases like going into the attic and finding your grandmother's old love letters. Yeah, that's true about uh, 
about frame shifting varicon. So there are some genes in very small viruses that actually overlap, and so they have to be read in different frames in order to uh, in order to be read correctly. I always learn more from the questions that people ask here than I do from from uh, doing the presentation. Wow. Fascinating, Stephen. I, I'm reading your I'm reading your thing about eye surgery. People that don't have a lens and so they can they can see ultraviolet. Ooh, metric chromat C, 100 million color. That's pretty impressive. 15% of women? Wow. Between the red and green tones. Okay, so it, it, is, that, um, it is that extra green gene that has produced it. So it's already changing. Oh my God, that is so cool. Fascinating. Thanks for that little tidbit, Stephen. That is really interesting. Oh, yes, we're having a, a uh, talk back on um, Fireside on Wednesday. Well, Phil, it was a fun project. Actually, I'm going to I'm going to give it again to uh, uh, probably a reduced version um, to the faculty when we do our university college day this spring. 